Good morning. If you are joining us this morning by way of the internet, we want to welcome you to the Pasco Community Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are going to be part of our service this morning. We, uh, uh, we have already been singing God's praises. We've done some praying. And now it's almost time for us to get into the preaching of the Word of God. But before we do that, uh, it's a uh, joy for me this week to have my daughter from Michigan visiting with us. And so my daughter, Carly, is going to come and sing some special music for us this morning. Bibles, please, this morning, and turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 5 this morning, where we'll be looking, John chapter 5. And once you get to John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at the first nine verses of this chapter. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And Jesus saw him, when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that 
days, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled uh, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to look into it. We pray that through the working of your Holy Spirit, you'll speak to each and every one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about the subject of grace. Grace. It's a subject... We preach about, or we, we, it's a subject we sing about, and we even testify of the amazing grace that God has so wonderfully shed abroad in our lives. But what do we mean by the term grace? Well, one of my favorite definitions was given by a man named G.W. Knight. This is what he wrote to, descri to describe, describe grace. He said, when a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, that is a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that is an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no award, yet receives them anyway, that is a good picture of God's unmerited favor, and that's what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. Now, in this particular passage, in John chapter 5, Jesus has come to Jerusalem and has come through the Sheep Gate, uh, where there is a pool nearby called Bethesda. A number of years ago, uh, Bethesda was excavated by archaeologists and was found, sure enough, to be made up of five porches and it had a spring-fed uh, pool. Now, our text tells us it was a place where people brought the sick and lame and diseased for healing. And John records some kind of miraculous stirring of the waters, and the first one to step in when the water was stirred would receive healing. So this pool was a place filled with people who had no hope in life and could not help themselves. And this is a clear picture of many people in our world who spiritually are in the same condition as this man. Their lives are wrecked and ruined, not by a physical disease, but by sin. And they call out for help, but unfortunately, everywhere they turn for help, there is none to be found because they haven't turned to the right person. But in this passage, this becomes a place, this Bethesda becomes a place where one man is able to find the grace of God for his soul. He would experience something through Jesus Christ uh, that would change his life forever. His condition would no longer remain the same, but he would experience radical change. And this is what grace brings into the lives of the lame and broken and sick in sin. And so I wonder, have you experienced the grace of God? Has your life had as radical a change as this man? Or, or, is your life in such bad condition that you're not sure what to do next or where to turn? Well, let me tell you what we need. You need to experience the wonderful grace of God. And so if you would allow me to do so, over the next few minutes, I want to 
to show you five things about the grace of God from this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want you to notice the place of grace. If you look back again at verse 2, uh, we read, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. This verse tells us that Jesus came to a pool owned by the sheep market, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. We're also told that, uh, that at this pool, there are five porches where the sick and helpless people needing healing were laid. Now, I don't believe anything is placed in this Bible haphazardly. I believe everything in this Bible is in here for a reason. And having said that, did you notice that John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, intentionally tells us there are five porches in this pool area? You say, now, Pastor, why would such a piece of information be so important to consider? Uh, why is the number of porches important? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You see, the number five is without a doubt the number of grace in the Bible. Uh, you see, if you do a study of Bible numerics, you find that the number five is often associated with grace. For instance, we find that the fifth time that Noah is mentioned in the Bible, it is mentioned with grace. Noah 5 8, uh, rather Genesis 5 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's also true that Noah was 500 years old when he begat the lineage that was to repopulate the earth after the flood. The first time Noah's name is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 5. The Bible tells us that the flood waters prevailed on the earth for exactly 150 days. That breaks down to exactly five months on the Jewish calendar. And so the number five is associated with Noah, and Noah is associated with grace. And we see things like that in the New Testament as well. For instance, the name of Titus, five letters. Uh, it's found 13 times. I don't know why it's found 13 times, but I know this. The fifth time that it's mentioned, it's mentioned with grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 6. And so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, he would also finish in you uh, that, uh, that, uh, that sense of grace. Uh, that same grace also. And my point is uh, simply that the number five is associated with grace throughout of the Bible. And from this premise on the number five, we can conclude that God intended to show Bethesda, which has five porches found in John chapter five, that this is a picture of grace. He, he, wanted, us to, he wanted us to see grace in the story of Bethesda. Now, here's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the extension of God's grace. I'm thankful that God's grace is not limited to one particular place. Uh, I think of uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all uh, men, right? Uh, there's no limit to it. I'm thankful that God's grace extends beyond the boundaries of any limitations that men might try to place on. See, the, the place of grace is the place where God meets you with his mercy and his undeserved favor and bestows upon you the greatest healing of all, which is spiritual redemption and restoration. And you know where this wonderful idea of grace came from? It came from the heart and mind of God himself. And Calvary is one of the most beautiful pictures of his grace. It was at Calvary that God, through his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, expressed his grace beyond 
measure. Uh, I love the words to the old hymn, At the Cross. Are you familiar with that hymn? It says, At the Cross, at the Cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Praise God that because of Calvary, because of the cross, we can all come to the place of grace and receive it free. Now, the next thing that I want you to see in this passage is not just the place of grace, but I also want you to see the person of grace, and specifically the person in need of grace. Look at verse 3. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, awaiting for the moving of the Lord. You know, over the years, I've come across people who have said things like this. Why would God love me? Why would God? want to give grace to a person like me. Do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you, do, do you even know what kind of person I am? Now, I'm not sure what kind of contact you might have had with those kind of people, but I can tell you I've had contact with some people over the years that if you knew what they've done and where they've been, you might feel your face blushing with redness. I've learned over the 40 years that the Lord has allowed me to be a pastor and preacher of his word that sin really has no limit to where it will take a person. In fact, there's a, there's a gospel song about that that says this. It says, uh, sin will uh, take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you far more than you want to pay. I have counseled with people who have made choices to walk on some very dark and evil paths. And I've looked into their eyes only to discover that they're filled with pain and shame and hurt and regret and even grief. I listen to them tell their stories of how they destroyed their lives and the, and the lives of the people they love the most. I, I've heard them uh, make comments like, I wanted to stop. I knew what I was doing was wrong. I, I knew that if I continued on this course that I would eventually be at the place where I am now. But no matter how much I wanted to stop, no matter how much I knew it was wrong, no matter how much it hurt me that I was hurting the people I loved and that I knew loved me, I couldn't get out. I have cried with those people uh, and their families who have uh, suffered the pain alongside of them. I've prayed for them. I've prayed with them. Only at times to see them get even worse. In other words, what I'm describing for you are the people who are suited for grace. Now, maybe you would say, Pastor, I've never walked in such dark paths. I've never really found myself in such horrible sin as it seems uh, others have found themselves in. But can I just tell you this? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all. Now, let me stop there a second and say, when God says all, he means all. Let's be clear about that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it repeats the same sentiment uh, with a word of warning in Romans 6.23 when it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our uh, Lord. So listen carefully. You are not a person in need of grace because you've wasted years in a bottle of liquor. You're not a person in need of grace because you've given yourself to some addictive drug or behavior. You're not a person in need of grace because you have lived a, a filthy lifestyle of sexual immorality. No, you're a person in need of grace simply because you're a sinner. And there is no hope that naturally lies within you 
that could ever merit you seeing heaven or experiencing eternal glory. Without the grace of God moving in and doing the work in your life, you're hopeless. It matters not how awful your lifestyle has been or how mild it has been. The great thing is God's grace is sufficient to meet you exactly where you are in your life. You are a person in need of grace. You're just a candidate God is looking for to extend His grace to. He desires to trade all your failures and shortcomings for His righteousness. He desires to exchange no faults for His uh, favor. Now, uh, maybe in your mind you're asking this question. How do you know that God wants to extend grace to me? What makes you sure that I am qualified to be a person that God wants to show grace to? And that's a great question. How do I know? It's because of what we see next in our text. Look at verse 6. Here we see the presentation of grace. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now think about that question that Jesus asks in verse 6. The question is simple. Will thou be made whole? Jesus just outright asks him, would you like to be whole? And I love that word whole in this verse because Jesus is not asking, you know, would you like to quit using drugs? He's not asking, would you like to quit being a drunkard? He's not asking, would you, would you like to get away from offering yourself in lewd and immoral uh, behavior? Uh, you see, what, what's wrong with our society today is instead of treating the cause of the problem, we want to just treat the symptoms. We want to try to fix the minor and forget all about the major issue. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's suppose that, uh, that an individual is by all uh, outward accounts fairly healthy, they're, they live life to its fullest, and they're enjoying life. But one day this person develops a cough. He thinks he's getting a cold. So he goes down to the pharmacy and purchases an, purchases an over-the-counter uh, type of cough medicine. But what he discovers is this cough medicine is not working. This cough is not going away. And so now he becomes concerned. So he goes to the family doctor, and the doctor checks his ears, his throat, and nasal passages, only to discover that there's no sign uh, that this man has a cold. And the doctor is concerned. So he decides to schedule a battery of tests. And once the tests have been done, he discovers that this person has a massive growth that is abnormal and concerning. So he schedules an appointment with an oncologist, sends his patient to this doctor. This doctor does a biopsy and discovers it is indeed cancer. Now listen here. Listen here. Could you imagine this oncologist coming back to the person and saying, we know that you have a very aggressive form of cancer. And we know that your cough is because of this cancer. However, we're just going to give you a really strong cough medicine that should help lessen the cough to almost nothing, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that if that happened to you, you would be outraged that the doctor has chosen to only deal with a symptom when he should be dealing with the root cause. And this is the question that Jesus is asking this man. Uh, Jesus is not simply interested in giving him back his legs. No. Now, there's no doubt Jesus cares about this man's physical plight because we can read over and over and over uh, again how compassionate Jesus was as he walked on this earth. In fact, many times Jesus touched a person's physical need uh, uh, before he even met their spiritual need. But when Jesus asks the question, what uh, will thou be made whole? He's not simply asking, would you like to walk again? Jesus had a much greater understanding of this man's need. Jesus knew that what this man really needed was a spiritual healing. 
Now, can I say this, and I don't say this to be mean, but it is sad to see people who only want to come to the Lord when they found themselves in a tight or tough spot in life. Some people want the Lord to respond to them like some magic wand or some genie in a bottle. Some want to treat the symptoms, but the Lord would like to treat the cause. So let me ask you the question that Jesus asked this man. Would you like to be made whole? That is, instead of just getting over a few sinful symptoms, would you like to get down to the root cause of the problem and get saved and get forgiven and get delivered uh, from your sin? Now, maybe you're concerned whether it work, would work for you the same way it worked for this fellow. Maybe the question in your mind is, what guarantee do I have that this would work for me? Well, let me show you what we have next in verses 7 and 8. Here we have the provider of grace. The infinite man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. John gives such a detailed description of this person that we have information like this man's legs were impotent. He was a lame man. This man was lying in a place where all kinds of folks had problems and sicknesses. John tells us that this man had been in this condition for 38 years, which is a, a long time uh, for this man to be that helpless. We also learn that he had no one to help him get uh, into the water when it stirred. Can, can you imagine being brought to a place like this and being just dropped off by your family and friends only to be left all alone and have no help or hope that you would ever get in to that water. This man's condition was hopeless. And it was so hopeless that he wasn't holding his breath uh, that whosoever was talking uh, to him uh, you know, could do much for it. Now, he may have been hoping that, that whoever it was standing before him would be gracious enough to help him get into the water at the time of the stirring. Uh, maybe it was getting close to the time of year that the water uh, would be stirred by the angel. And maybe the, the crippled man uh, thought, well, you know, maybe this time I'll have a shot. If this man is concerned enough uh, to ask me such a question as, would you like to be made whole? But, Whatever was running through his mind, I'm sure he was not thinking that he would receive what he was about to receive. And let me tell you this. This is what's wonderful about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what preconceived ideas you might have about coming to Jesus Christ and how he can change your life. But, but I can tell you that he will exceed your expectations. He will change your life in such a way that you would not ever even have imagined how wonderful life could be. And that's what Jesus does for this man. No sooner did Jesus get through hearing this man's plea and hearing his desire for someone to put him into the water when Jesus spoke words of healing into his life. He said, rise, take up thy bed. And walk. And let me tell you, it's one thing to talk about what can be done, but it's quite different to experience it and to find out how wonderful it really is. It's one thing to command the man to rise and walk, but it's quite a different thing for a man to actually get up and do so. And and, and that is the kind of power the Lord Jesus has. All he has to do is speak a word into your soul, and your life will be changed forever. You can read over and over again of the times that Jesus simply said a phrase of words, and miracles bounded into the earthly realm, and the lives of destitute and hopeless people were changed in an instant. That's because he is the all-powerful God 
of the universe. His name is Jesus Christ, and his name is the name that is above every name. He is the provider of grace. Now, let me close by showing you one more thing about God's amazing grace. The final thing I want to show you today is the product of grace. We've seen the place of grace, the, the, uh, the person of grace, presentation of grace, uh, provider of grace. We've seen all of this. Now, the product of grace. Look at verse 9. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The very first word of verse 9 that sticks out in my mind is the word immediately. Immediately. That's the way God works. He doesn't wait over a period of time. He doesn't wait to see if you're really all there or out. When God's grace shows up in your life, it begins to take an immediate effect. I will always remember the date, October 23rd, 1972. I will always remember that date because that was the day that the grace of God met me where I was and forever changed my life. On that day, I am experiencing the grace of God that I will never get over and I don't ever want to get over it. For the first time in my life, all of those Sunday school songs that I learned as a kid, all of those Sunday school lessons I heard as a kid, all of those memory verses I learned in Sunday school, all of a sudden, they took on a whole new meaning. The night that I called out to Christ and received Him as my What I'm sharing with you is that there was an immediate change in my life. Amen. When Jesus spoke into the life of this man in John 5, notice what happened. It says, immediately he was made whole and took up his bed and walked. He didn't just uh, get healed from being crippled. He got healed physically and spiritually that day. This man's life was changed in such a way that he would never be the same. And I believe when people met him and asked the question, weren't you the man that, that used to lay on one of those five porches and was crippled? What, what happened to you? I guarantee you, he replied, Man of many Jesus. And, and his grace changed my life completely. I'll never be the same again. You say, Pastor, how do you know he said that? Look at verse 15 in this chapter. It says, The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Now, you may be thinking, is this really what happens? If I put my faith and my trust in Christ, like this crippled man at Bethesda, will I really be a different person? Will I be able to live differently and think differently and act differently? Well, let me share with you what the Bible has to say about that subject. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes, you will be changed. Yes, you will live differently. Yes, you will think differently. Yes, you will act differently. And this is because once Christ is invited into your heart, once you respond to the, his knocking on the door of your heart, and you open up and you invite Christ in to be your Savior, Lord, once that happens, the next thing that happens is that the power of his resurrection and the power of his Holy Spirit moves in and changes your life completely. Calvary is the place of grace. 
But the question this morning is, do you want that grace? Will thou be made whole? Because of what Jesus has done there at Calvary, by shedding his blood and, and dying in your place, taking upon himself the penalty for sin that you deserve, because of what Jesus has done there, you can now come and have God's grace freely. And when you accept this offer of grace, it will forever change your life. Calvary is the place of grace. You, as a sinner, are a person in need of grace. Jesus alone is the provider of grace. And forgiveness, the assurance of heaven, and a changed life are the products of grace. But the reality is that you can't get any of these things on your own. They are bestowed upon you by the grace of God when you call out to Christ by faith and receive Him as your Savior and Lord. The Apostle Paul sums it up so well. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace I have saved you faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I'll leave you with the question that Jesus gave the man the best. Will thou be made? If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed, this morning, if you have never received Christ as your Savior, but you've heard about this wonderful grace that He offers to you, and the forgiveness and the eternal life and the changed life that comes along with it, and you're desirous of that, then this morning, I'm going to help you. I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer to invite Christ into your heart. And if you've never done so, pray right along with me. Now, understand that that just repeating a few words after the pastor is not going to save you. That's not, that's not the thing. You've got to believe what you pray. Because it's faith that makes all the difference. But if you'd like to pray along with you this morning, and invite Christ to be your Savior, why not just bow your head right now and pray right with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I now open my heart and invite you in to be my Savior and Lord. Please forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life and a home in heaven. Fill me with your peace and change my life. I now trust you and you alone for all of these things. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've been watching by way of the internet, and you prayed along with me this morning to receive Christ as your Savior, uh, if you would do me a favor and let me know, I'd appreciate it. You can either contact me by way of my Facebook page, or you can call me. My phone number is 401-568-4963. You can call me and let me know. Or you can write to me at Pasco Community Baptist Church, 111 Church Street, Pasco, Rhode Island, 02859. And if you'll get me a mailing address, I would love to send you a copy of our booklet, Water for New Sprouts. It's a book that I wrote years ago, but I've recently updated it a little bit. And I would love for you to have one. It will help you in your new walk with God. And if you did pray with me and receive Christ this morning, let me be the first to say, welcome to the family of God. We are so glad to have you as part of God's family. Now, I hope you'll have a blessed week, and I hope we'll see you again next week uh, right here on my Facebook channel. God bless you.